I was an immediate fan of the Super Nintendo upon its release in 1991. While so many people were transfixed on the competition between it and Sega's Genesis, I was driven by the simple curiosity of seeing how all their games turned out. Maybe because I was a bit older and had a job when these two platforms were competing, I just didn't care about the schoolyard arguments about which was better. In my eyes, these two complemented each other like peanut butter and jelly. Alone, they were special in their own right, yet when you were exposed to both libraries together, you had a stable of hits that were some of the best games ever made. But like the Genesis, I ran into my fair share of titles that I really disliked on the Super Nintendo. And that, my friends, is the subject of today's video. We have 10 games I didn't care too much for on Nintendo's 16-bit workhorse. I want to be clear that this is not a worse games video. You won't see the usual suspects like The Wizard of Oz, Batman Forever, Pit Fighter, Bebe's Kids, or Lester the Unlikely. Frankly, I already had low expectations for those stinkers based on their Genesis ports or the license they were based on in the first place. No, the 10 games I picked for you here were games I went into legitimately hoping for a decent experience, only to walk away shaking my head in utter defeat. Some of you may even think a few of these aren't necessarily bad, but again, I'm not shooting for a worse games list. Expectation is what decided the fate of this batch, and they are games that I can't stand to this very day. I hope you guys enjoy my least favorite Super Nintendo games. I was a big fan of Jean-Claude Van Damme back in the day, so I suffered the film Time Cop just for the action and martial arts. I thought the video game would be a competent beat-em-up at least, and boy was I wrong. This digitized monstrosity will immediately put you in mind of trash like Batman Forever, and it's just as bad. The story is actually a sequel to the film, but you won't care a lick as the long, drawn-out animations give way to broken hit detection and a sickening repetition of enemies. You get a gun to help you deal with those enemies, but the ammunition is scarce, so good luck with that. The stage design is also crazy simple. Most are little more than riding a few elevators to find the exit and move on. And my lord is this game ugly. Low-res digitized assets are smeared across the screen in a palette that would make NES games look impressive. There is absolutely nothing here worth a single word of praise. I have no clue how the developers at Cryo Interactive put this out on the market and thought it was something worth paying real money for. I know licensed games should never be trusted with any serious expectation, but this is worse than anything my wildest dreams could have imagined. Should you never have played this, do yourself a favor and skip it entirely. If you happen to be the type to play bad games for the shits and giggles, you have a new pony to add to the stable. In 1993, fighting games were showing up left and right, riding the coattails of Street Fighter II's meteoric success. I admit I was mesmerized by the genre and got duped by a number of games claiming to be the next best thing. Among those was Street Combat, an NCS and Irem joint that was a reskin of a Japanese Ranma title. But no matter what name this trash goes by, it's one of the worst fighters of its day. There's no real combo system here to speak of, the special moves are damn near useless, and the visuals are master system level simplicity. Nearly everything knocks you down, and there are moves here you can just spam repeatedly to gain an easy victory. You gotta love the AI here too. It's the kind of thing where it's either a sitting duck or overly aggressive. There is no in-between. I understand this was back in the day when fighting games were trying to compete with a vastly superior competitor, but surely the developers could have done better than this. I mean, just for frame of reference, this makes early fighters like Street Smart seem like the best thing ever. This one gets a special bit of hate from me because I actually spent good money on it, a time in my life when the price of a game was no joke. Sometimes you just gotta swallow your pride and admit you made a bad decision, but software like this was created to take advantage of children just looking to have a good time. If you think Shaq Fu was bad, I raise you street combat and challenge you to find me one that can best it. 
I really enjoyed Super Mario World. It was a great looking, playing, and sounding adventure. It started off the life of the Super Nintendo in fine form, so when 1993's Mario is Missing showed up courtesy of the software Toolworks, I thought it would be a great gift for my two little sisters. But this is a case of assuming Nintendo's track record would mean another winner, even if it was an educational title. More wrong I couldn't have been, because even for an edutainment game, it's a piss poor effort top to bottom. The gameplay is completely unintuitive. Even after having it explained to you, it kind of leaves you with a what the hell feeling to everything. Hidden behind the guise of a Mario adventure, Luigi goes looking for his brother across the globe. Essentially, you have to search across a handful of cities, talk to the people there, collect some items, answer a few questions, and that's pretty much it. You spend more time running around the drab environments than you do actually learning anything, and what little action there is comes and goes in a matter of seconds. I mean the interaction here is a joke. You can only speak to the same few people throughout the levels, and the objectives never change. It's a roadmap to boredom, hidden behind an extremely popular IP. The droning music is a headache, Yoshi is there just to speed you up, and even its target audience grows tired of it after a few minutes. My younger sisters were done with it the same day they first played it, leaving just me to try it and get my money's worth. Nope, this turd went straight back to Babbage's, a lesson that not everything with Nintendo's name on it is pure gold. Faceball 2000 has roots all the way back to Midi Maze on the Atari ST, a maze-like shooter where you have to hunt down other players and deathmatch-style contest. It showed up as Faceball 2000 on the Game Boy in 1991, before our Super Nintendo showing here the following year. As you can imagine, the idea of a 3D game this early was quite appealing. I mean, this is pre-Doom after all. But the reality is a nightmare of crap control, lack of play modes, and AI that is just a chore to play against. There are Super Nintendo fans out there that will swear up and down that they had fun with this, and while I would never call anyone I didn't know a liar, I cannot imagine any fun coming from this miserable pile of garbage. I fell victim to this just wanting something different to play, something unique, and since it had split screen action for two players, I thought why the heck not? But what you get is a game that is so painfully simple that the joy most take away from it is centered on the absurdity of its presentation. Apparently, stalking one another with emojis constitutes a good time for some folks. Well, it didn't do anything for me, and all I was left with was a game I desperately wanted to get rid of. Not even the graphics could save this mess, as the viewable area is only a tiny portion of the screen. I don't know, man. Maybe if you're easily entertained, this has something going for it. I absolutely couldn't stand it. Have a nice day. Although Chester Cheetah Too Cool to Fool was also released on the Genesis, it was here on the Super Nintendo that I first encountered it. Back in the early 90s, the mascot craze was in full swing and every publisher under the sun tried making their game the next big thing. You knew you were starting to scrape the bottom of the barrel when you started making games after mascots of salty snacks, yet many of these types of games were still pretty decent. Seems old Kaneko didn't get the memo on how these games worked, because this is one of the worst platformers you'll play on the Super Nintendo. It's slow, the sprites are too large making you an easy target, and the item powers are ridiculous. You can get a guitar where Chester jams out for 10 seconds just to kill one or two enemies around him. Get it on a water stage and you can actually jam your way right into damage. Then there's the sunglasses, which reveals hidden items by, you guessed it, dimming the hell out of the screen. I mean, come on, how did this seriously pass quality control testing? 
the visuals stink, the music sucks, and the stages become more and more tedious the deeper you get in. From the awkward mechanics of climbing vines to the actual stages that hides the enemies from you, this just descends into pure tedium after about 20 minutes or so. I never had high expectations for this one, but I did pick it up thinking it'd at least be something for the weekend. And if you last more than two or three stages, you're doing much better than I did. I was looking for something on the level of Bubsy. Instead, I got this, a garishly bright boar fest that plays at a snail's pace. Save your money and go buy yourself another one of the dozen platformers for the Super Nintendo. Pretty much all of them are better. In 1994, we got the Super FX powered game called Vortex on the Super Nintendo. It was done by the same developer that did Star Fox, though this is nowhere near the same level of quality. It sure looks like it though. In fact, if someone told you at the time it was a sequel to Star Fox, it'd be easy to believe. Vortex has you battling it out in space, on land, and inside bunkers. You have the ability to transform into a mech, a jet, and a couple of different tank style vehicles. They all have their uses, though the slow and cumbersome gameplay limits the fun factor incredibly. It does have a few cool differences from Star Fox, like more control over where you go, but the interaction with enemies kills any joy that should have brought. Nothing feels accurate, and the enemy fire comes at you in 360 degrees, despite you not being able to move fast enough to deal with it. On paper, it has everything it needs to be impressive, especially on a 16-bit console like the Super Nintendo. You can have a list a mile long of things that sound cool, but if none of it works well, it's just not a fun game. And that really is the final verdict on old Vortex here. It's just not fun. At all. What makes this all the worse is, is that Argonaut was clearly trying to capitalize on Star Fox's success by making it look so similar. I fell for it, and I'm here to let my experience help guide you away from this substandard Fox McCloud wannabe. It lacks all the magic and fun that made the Nintendo Classic so special. When Doom dropped on the Super Nintendo in 1995, it had that big Super FX2 chip emblem on the front and a back proclaiming blazing fast three-dimensional graphics. I was a Doom fan, so driven by both fandom and curiosity, I just had to see it. I mean, it was Doom. How bad could it be? And what a mistake that was because this stinker looks like crap, plays like crap, and is point blank one of the worst versions of Doom ever released at retail. There are no walls or floors, everything is grainy, and the gameplay is genuinely terrible. The awful performance has a direct impact on the control, and trying to shoot anything accurately is a nightmare. There are only two bright spots here. First, the content is surprisingly complete. You get most of episodes 1, 2, and 3. You also get maps that are closer to their PC counterpart in complexity as opposed to the stripped back versions other consoles received. And perhaps most importantly on that front, you get both the Spider Demon and Cyber Demon to fight. Second, you get one heck of a soundtrack that takes great advantage of the Super Nintendo chip tunes. It really is quite something for a non-CD based console. But those things pale in comparison to its negatives. The dog ugly visuals and the substandard performance really ruin everything. By the time you add in the other little irritations like the tiny screen, the lack of monster infighting, and some botched sound effects, this Doom isn't really worth your time. Years later I would learn this doesn't run on the Doom engine at all, and was instead ported into something called the Reality Engine. I appreciate the effort this must have taken to make this possible, but the only reality here is, this never should have been released. I'd rather play just about any other Doom than this miserable waste of time and money.
I was quite the fan of the WWF in the 1980s and early 90s. I tuned in every week to see the likes of Hulk Hogan and the Macho Man beat down their competition. So when WWF Super WrestleMania was announced for the Super Nintendo, I was really excited to give it a go. The graphics and sound were definitely impressive for a 1992 release. Each wrestler looked like their on-screen counterpart, the arena looked great, and the theme songs that played while choosing your guy were quite well done. But the problems started when you began playing. The moves list is woefully limited, and there are no finishing moves. That's right, no Doomsday device from the Road Warriors, no Hulk Hogan leg drop, no Million Dollar Dream, no Tombstone Pile Driver. This means that you'll be punching and kicking a lot because the button mashing tug of war to get to the rest of the limited move set just often isn't worth it. There isn't but so many times you can suplex or body slam someone. There's a few moves you get from running into the ropes and you can take the fight outside the ring, but you just find yourself wishing there was more to do. To exacerbate all this is the serious lack of modes to explore. One on one, tag team and a weak survivor series is all you get. No run for the various championship belts, no cage match, nor any Royal Rumble options. This engine would be improved greatly with WWF Royal Rumble released the following year. It had more moves, more wrestlers, and more modes. It's a massive improvement over this stinker. This was also on the Sega Genesis with a number of improvements and a slightly different roster, but I still wouldn't call that a good game. When Alien vs. Predator hit the arcades in 1994 courtesy of Capcom, it was a beautiful beat-em-up that my friends and I loved. The multiplayer was fast, fierce, and loaded with enemies to kill. You can imagine my absolute elation when I learned it was on the Super Nintendo, and I just had to get a copy so I could have the same great arcade action at home. But ignorance is not always bliss, my friends. What I didn't know at the time was is that the Super Nintendo version of Alien vs. Predator was not a port of the Capcom coin-op, and was actually released 8 months prior by Activision. And let's be 100% clear here, this is not only not the same game, it's an entirely different class of software. This single player beat-em-up has below average graphics and sound, stiff animations, and gameplay that feels incredibly shallow and uninteresting. You can only play as the Predator and your arsenal of attacks are so weak that it takes forever to take down an alien of any size. You're also wailing away on the same handful of aliens the entire trip, making this one hell of a dull adventure. Variety is not this title's strong suit at all. This was a case where I went in with all the wrong assumptions but still hoped for a great adventure. Nope, not only was this nowhere near as good as Capcom's game but it didn't stand on its own either. It was missing the multiplayer and visual pizzazz needed to keep you coming back for more, instead leaving you with a dull, drab, and repetitive outing unbecoming of these two fantastic franchises. This is going to show my age, but I really enjoyed the Jetsons as a kid. It came on after school and syndication for years back in the 1980s, and I watched it regularly until new favorites like G.I. Joe and Transformers replaced it. That appreciation endured, however, and when the Jetsons Invasion of the Planet Pirates showed up on the Super Nintendo, I gave it a whirl hoping for the best. And it's so close to being something respectable. It starts off looking and sounding like the cartoon enough to get the job done. It even seems at first the little vacuum mechanic might be done well enough to make this worth a play, but things quickly become so incredibly frustrating. Enemies respawn at the slightest movement of the screen, usually resulting in cheap hits. The vacuum you use as a weapon also acts as a means of getting around. This becomes tiresome as it's overused and easy to fall, forcing you to replay sections over and over. This leads quickly to fatigue as you grow tired of jumping through hoops to do the simplest of things. And man oh man are the boss fights hair ripping madness. These guys take lots of hits and your large sprite takes far too little damage for them to be enjoyable. 
there's a boss rush towards the end that puts this one square in the what the hell column. That leaves the Jetsons as a huge letdown. You can see the beginnings of something special here, yet it's dashed and broken by poor execution and irritations that could have been easily avoided. Unlike most of the games on this list, I do recommend you play this one. Many of you may actually find enough here to enjoy it. It will also lead you to Yokai Buster, a reskin altered edition of this game released only in Japan. It features numerous changes to the gameplay speed, enemies, levels, and music, resulting in a game that is much better. So in this instance, a game I dislike led to finding a game I really enjoyed. It doesn't happen often, but I'll take what I can get. Going back and playing these games, it really does hammer home that you can dislike something for lots of different reasons. Sometimes it isn't as simple as it just looks and plays bad. It can also be a case that you see the potential for good and are disgusted that it never quite got there. It can also be a situation where a game mimics something else so closely, but fails on pretty much every level to be as good as what it's imitating. I mean, if you have no shame to copy another game that close, just freaking go all the way and give us something worth our time. But like I said in the opening, it really does all come down to expectation. The bad games that hurt the most are the ones that come out of left field when you were hoping for something better. While I loved gaming magazines to death as a kid, I didn't buy every single issue, which means it was easy to fall victim to a bad game you had never seen the reviews for. And then of course there were bad games that inexplicably got great scores, telling you they were totally worth your money. It kinda always made me feel like a fair number of publishers slipped some extra advertising funds to these magazines and made sure their games were seen in a positive light. Or at the very least, the game journalists didn't want to piss anybody off with viciously low scores. But don't let this pile of stinkers make you think I didn't love my Super Nintendo. It sat right there for years beside my Sega Genesis with me playing and supporting it every bit as much. These two venerable powerhouses were much better together than they were apart. I'm Sega Lord X. Thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.